So are you all, you'll enjoy this one. This will be a good class. Actually, as perverse as it sounds, I prefer when there are fewer students here because I get a better discussion. Isn't, isn't that odd, though? I mean, professors like more attendance. I actually like fewer because the people here are interested and they are more likely to engage. What? <laughs> Rough to me. It wouldn't be a problem. Okay, uh, before I begin, and then you guys get a nice benefit. Uh, this is Justice Busby. He's a friend of mine. He's looking for interns this summer. If you're interested in interning, he's on the 14th Court of Appeal. It's literally two miles away. Go right down Fannin. It's right there. Uh, he's looking for summer interns. So if you want, send me a resume and writing sample, and I'll forward it on to him. Okay? Oh, that's funny. Is that a joke? No, no, no. Unfortunately, judicial interns don't get paid. Um, although, as 1Ls, this is something you should really be considering because this will parlay your experience for your second summer. Um, I don't know how your prospects are for first summer, but this would be a good guy. He actually just went the bench right a year or two ago. A uh, really smart guy, very nice. He clerked in the Supreme Court. His wife clerked in the Supreme Court. Uh, serious brain power. Uh, so you would profit immensely, perhaps not with money, but you would profit immensely from working with him. So if you're interested, send me, his res send me your resume and your uh, information. I will forward it on to the justice. Okay? <sighs> okay. Questions about what we did last time, whatever that was. Any questions? No, they're never questions. No one ever remembers. Okay, so today, okay. So let's actually start off with with common law marriage. I think it actually provides a nice uh, uh, starting point. Let's start back there for a change. Okay, so uh, Courtney, what is what is common law marriage? <laughs> Good. Why? And I swear this is going to be relevant in a minute. Why? Why did this begin common law marriage? Why? Why, why did that begin as a thing? Right. So that's 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 a, that's the right answer. But that's a, it's a, only a partly answer. Actually, stop the sliding. So it's actually funny in Kentucky when they were dividing up the counties, they divide the counties so it would never be more than one day by horseback to the county seat to the courthouse. In Texas, they can't do that because it's like, you know, humongous. But in Kentucky, they were able to divide it up. So ostensibly, the reason why was because it was very difficult for people to get married. But what people often forget is that for much of recorded history, marriage was not something the state got involved in. It wasn't. It was only something that the church got involved in or, or whatever the religious, mostly the church. It's only of somewhat recent vintage that the law even began to recognize what a marriage is. In fact, the idea of the common law marriage evolved, as the name suggests, from the common law, that this was something that judges kind of recognized. It was only much later that the idea of the, the civil ceremony became a thing. So it's interesting that we saw this vestige, this common law marriage, as a reflection of the fact that for much of, much of our history, marriage was not something that the state got involved in. But we do know today that it is something the state gets involved in. So this is actually the Texas Code 2401. This is actually what governs informal marriage. Uh, and it actually has certain requirements. Uh, they have to agree to be married. Uh, they have to live together. They have to represent others who are married. This is usually the, the hardest one. You have to hold yourself out as if you were married. It's not enough to simply say, oh, yeah, that's my wife. You have to actually act it. Um, the reason where this becomes significant, though, is if, say, two people or living together, and they break up, and the wife wants division of assets, right? Or the husband wants custody of the kids. If they were actually common law married, then for all intents and purposes under tax law, they're considered married, and they would get all the community property, they get custody, all those other things. But if it turns out they only thought they were boyfriend and girlfriend, or perhaps one of them thought they were married, the other one didn't, then you have a problem. So what you have is people arguing and screaming back and forth saying, no, 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 we were married. No, we weren't. And it gives rise to a lot of um, kind of evidentiary issues, which might seem simple, but how do you prove that you're holding yourself as married? So it's somewhat on the wane. Um, ten states recognize it. One of them, of course, here is right here in Texas. Um, it's not too common, but I suppose it, it does happen. I actually have a... a a friend, uh, her, her, her father passed away, and the mom kind of moved in with the guy, and they've been cohabitating for years, and the 
pretend they're married, but they never got a ceremony. So they're they're effectively married. I don't know what that means when one that passes away. But for most of Texans, the way they get married is through this way, marriage license. And if you notice, there's a bolded word here, a man and a woman desiring to enter into ceremony of marriage must obtain a marriage license. Okay? Those words were not always in these statutes. This one is a very recent vintage. It was only added, I think, in the last maybe 15 years or so. It says, a license may not be issued for the marriage of persons of the same sex. Now, the reason why this was added is the crux of what we're going to be talking about today. So we start with I or DOMA. Let's start with DOMA. Okay. So did anyone pay attention to the news yesterday? Yeah, a little bit. There was a big thing at the Supreme Court. Kind of a kind of a, kind of a big deal. Uh, the Iowa case, which we'll get to last, I think will be a good summary. So yesterday at the Supreme Court was the issue of the Defense of Marriage Act. And in order to understand the Defense of Marriage Act, we need a little bit of history. So in the early 1990s, I think in 1994 or 1995, now this is actually a map, which is actually very helpful, that explains how gay marriage has kind of evolved in the country. I'm sorry? I can't scroll. This is about the best I can do. So this is a map that explores how gay marriage evolved in, in, in our country. And so this map is starting in the year 1990. Okay. Yellow means illegal. Gray means none. So in the early 1990s, it wasn't even a thing that they had to worry about gay marriage. It just wasn't on the radar. Um, in 1988, the Supreme Court had the case of Bowers with Hardware that said the state can ban sodomy. So effectively making gay sex would be illegal. That was fine. But this process changed somewhat rapidly between the 1990s. So one of the first things that happened, you'll see one of the first changes of states to change color. Where is it? There's Idaho that bans it. OK. So right here, see Hawaii turns green? Hawaii turned green right here. This is in, uh, I think, uh, 1996 or so, 1997. There were prospects in Hawaii in the 1990s of the legalization of same-sex unions. Not marriage, but civil unions. When people saw this coming, they started panicking. So this is a common law question, but why would it matter if Hawaii recognizes same-sex unions? Who cares? What, why does Texas care about that? Anyone? Yeah. And this is relevant for DOMA. So the Constitution provides that Every state shall give what's called full faith and credit to the other states. So if one state recognizes a marriage, then by law, other states must recognize it as well. You'll study this in maybe conflicts of law. This makes sense. If you get married in New York and you move to New Jersey, you shouldn't have to get married again. Or say if you have a business that's incorporated in New York, New Jersey should recognize the fact that it's incorporated in that state if you move. This is something that's not controversial. But what started panicking is that there were prospects that if one state recognized marriage, every single person who got married there would then move away. So what would stop people from, you know, same-sex couples moving to Hawaii for a day, getting married on vacation, and then coming back to uh, Texas or Mississippi or Louisiana? I'm picking on those states by purpose. I'll show you why later. So Congress said, all right, we'll create this law called the Defense of Marriage Act. The Defense of Marriage Act does a lot of things, but for purposes of this, of this lesson, does one important thing. For purposes of federal law, it defines marriage as that between a man and a woman. It's a very simple definition. But more profoundly, it modifies the full faith and credit clause. It says, hey, Louisiana, you don't have to recognize the same-sex union from Hawaii. You don't have to. Now, was this needed? Not really. For example, say you're a common law marriage in, in Texas, right? Jersey probably won't recognize that. There's nothing new with states not recognizing certain types of unions from other states. There's not a problem with that. In fact, usually there's something called public policy, where if a state says, 
New Jersey says it's against our public policy to re recognize a common law marriage. We won't. A lot of states, even before the Defense of Marriage Act was passed, banned it. They put it in their state constitutions. So in some senses, DOMO is overkill. It wasn't needed. But for the other states that hadn't gotten there yet, this stopped them. And in fact, a lot of the states that might have wanted to recognize it now couldn't. So then DOMA did two things. But the purpose of defining marriage between a man and a woman uh, matters with respect to property law. So let's go back to this graph. So this is like 1990. Let's just fit. Can I zoom out? Oh, there we go. Oh, perfect. I realized I could do that. So this is 1996, right? In 1996, President Clinton signs the Defense of Marriage Act. The purpose of it was very clear. It's to defend the institution of marriage. Um, and, and, the, and the legislative history of it is, is replete with references to uh, things that are not so good about gay people. For example, it says, quote, this law reflects the, quote, moral disapproval of homosexuality. Um, this was a law that was born out of a recognition that uh, this is not something society should promote, that marriage is something special, and we should not be uh, sanctioning something to detract from that. We'll get back to this in a little bit. Uh, the law was passed in 1996, and look how this map lights up real quick. So it goes from almost all gray, 94, 95, 96, yellow, illegal, 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 illegal. Okay. What happens here? Alaska turns blue, right? The Alaska Supreme Court recognized same-sex marriage. What do you think happened the very next year? It turns orange. People overrode that. So for much of the 90s, some courts start to recognize same-sex marriage. And almost immediately, by popular referendum or by legislative fiat, the courts were reversed. So at this point, Hawaii is the only place where civil unions have some rights. Keep going, keep going. OK. California. What happened in California? Did the, did the, did the Constitution amend it or the voters? No, no, no. The California Supreme Court. I'm sorry, no, this the first one was California legalized civil unions. So what they said was, we will give same-sex couples all the rights of marriage, but not the title. That matters to, to a lot of people. So we got to keep going, going. OK, Vermont also legalizes civil unions. OK, keep going. Nebraska, illegal in the Constitution. Missouri. So at this point, by 2001, nearly every state in the union has illegal under either the Constitution or by statute. Okay, Washington D.C. allows civil unions in 2002. Nevada uh, banned same-sex marriage. Texas illegal. Ohio, Virginia. Okay, then Massachusetts comes in. Okay, so then here's Massachusetts. Massachusetts then legalizes gay marriage. That was part. I think it was from the Massachusetts Supreme Court. But that was like the first big state to do it. And people started flocking to Massachusetts to get married there. Um, it, it, was a, it, was a, it was a big thing. So look what happens after Massachusetts legalizes gay marriage. Like, like 2004, those are all constitutional amendments, all the red. Within, what, six months, a year after Massachusetts legalized same-sex marriage, the map turns red. Quick, right? And not just like, you know, red states like Michigan and Ohio. These aren't, these are bellwether states and, and pro probably blue on most maps. This is 2004. In 2004, John Kerry and every single other Democrat nominee for president came out and said, I oppose gay marriage. All of them, you can pull the video on YouTube. They, 2004, every Democrat candidate, like nine of them, Hillary Clinton, that she opposed gay marriage. All of them said it consistently. Just fascinating to look at the history, how far we've come. So it's 2004, you know, Louisiana, got around to Louisiana. Ah, but what happens here, 2005, California turns green, a, a greener, okay? And then t Texas in, in, the, in the Constitution, okay, Alabama, Nebraska. Yeah, so like right here, all the states which have banned it by statute, then go and put in their Constitution because they don't want to be influenced by Massachusetts or California. This is 2006, what, like seven years ago? This is not very long ago. Okay, then New Jersey gets civil unions. Washington has some sort of civil unions. Oregon, kind of the coasts are filling it. Ah, but this is the bellwether. bellwether. 
Cali turned blue, right? What happened? California Supreme Court said it is unconstitutional for California to give these civil unions all the benefits of marriage without calling it marriage. In other words, you can't give someone all these benefits without giving it the label. Therefore, the California Supreme Court said you need to have gay marriage as an interpretation of the California Constitution. This was June 2008. So what do you think California did after that? Prop 8. Look how quick California went from blue to green. Green means your civil unions are legal. Prop 8 was passed in 2008. Prop 8 said, we will amend the California Constitution so that there's no gay marriage. That's what it said. Marriage is between one man and one woman. We're fine with civil unions. You want to call it something else? Good. But don't call it marriage. That's not what it is. California turned green real quick. This is when the Prop 8 lawsuit was filed. Okay, I'll come back to it in a minute. So this was roughly four, four and a half years ago. So when you guys were mostly in college, I suppose. Not, not that long ago. Let's keep going. Iowa. Oh, what happened to Iowa in 2009? You guys read 18 pages of that garbage, right? <laughs> I'll get back to it. I'm sorry it was so long, but it, it's, it's, a good, it's a good opinion to read. Iowa. Did the people of Iowa say we want gay marriage? No, they didn't. The justices of the Iowa Supreme Court recognized that under the Iowa Constitution, for reasons we'll go to in a bit, there's a right to same-sex marriage under the Iowa Constitution. This, this was the biggie. It's not in the book, and I'm not sure why they didn't include it, but after the 2009 vote, three of the justices in the Iowa Supreme Court were basically taken out of office. A lot of very pro-family uh, Christian groups dumped a lot of money into these races. These are unopposed retention races. What that means is a justice doesn't run against someone. They just say, do you want to bring this guy back? And these three justices of the Iowa Supreme Court, I think there were six or seven, lost in direct response to this. Okay? But in some sense, the map started turning a little bit more blue after this. 2009, so then we have civil unions in Michigan and Colorado. Most of the West Coast uh, uh, becomes at least having civil unions. Um, okay, we have Vermont and Massachusetts with, with gay marriage. Okay, keep going. Things are mostly the same. Okay, then the biggie comes. New York legalizes gay marriage. I remember I mean, this, was, this was two years ago, but this was 2011. This was a big one. This is like the biggest state to legalize it. And it was done through the legislature, not done through the courts, which was significant. So let's go ahead. So then other states are following. And Washington and Maine uh, legalized it recently. So this is what the map looks like pretty much today. Uh, not too different than an electoral college map uh, between red and blue. Uh, but on the coast, it's OK. On the northeast, it's OK. And then down here, good luck. Um, this is the story of how constitutional change happens. This is usually something we see over a lifetime. But you're all fortunate in respect to have seen this change so quickly. Lawrence v. Texas was argued 10 years ago today, right? Look at the map in March of 2003. This was the map when Lawrence v. Texas was argued. There was nothing except for Vermont and California, basically 48 states, or, or, or Hawaii, I guess 47 states, where you cannot have any kind of same-sex union. This is how far we've come in 10 years. This was the map in June of 2008 when Prop 8 was passed. So when Ted Olson and David Boyes, the attorneys for the Popular Challenge, this was a map they were looking at. This was a map that said, do we bring a case to the US Supreme Court saying this is a right to gay marriage? This is the map they were looking at. This is the map today. It's funny, in teaching this, I realize I'll never teach this class the same way ever again, most likely. Because whatever I teach this next semester will have an opinion from the Supreme Court. So what the Supreme Court does here, though, will be very interesting. There are three possible options of how they can rule this in the merits. One, they could turn this entire map blue. They can say every state must 
offer gay marriage. <laughs> it would be unconstitutional not to offer gay marriage. So every state in this map, from Texas to Alabama to Mississippi, will now have to have same-sex marriage, notwithstanding that all their constitutions were amended in this fashion. Some may want that result. I don't think it's going to happen. It's a very radical result. Even if you think back to the desegregation cases, everyone thinks of Brown versus Board as this kind of canonical case of civil rights. Brown didn't actually desegregate the cases. If you read the opinion at the very end, it says we should desegregate the schools with all deliberate speed. That was the quote. Courts don't like to move so quickly to the entire map blue. Okay? So what's the other option? Well, the other option is to say, well, for states that are green, right, that have already given civil, uh, I think there's about eight or nine of them, for states that are green, that have already given some sort of civil union benefits, it's unconstitutional for you to give these benefits but not call it marriage. I Meaning, in other words, you don't have a rational basis on which withhold the title of marriage. So what that would do is that for the eight states that have already given civil unions, they would need to give marriage. So that's the more moderate solution. But that would have a weird impact. Because that way, you would have these states which are solid blue, the other states would be stuck. And they'd have no incentive to give civil union benefits. Because the second they give some sort of civil union benefits, they're stuck. They then need to call it marriage. So it would actually maybe be counterproductive. The other option is to say, you know what? Screw it, California's different. Just, <laughs> they're different. They had a very unique circumstance with Prop 8 where they had a right and it was taken away. Rule on that narrow ground. But the last two options would be very odd because that'd be like saying you have equal rights in one or nine states but not 50. And it'd be very hard for the court to write that opinion because that's like saying, well, you know, we'll desegregate these states, but those schools can have segregated schools. That's, you know, no problem there. That'd be weird. So it's probably going to happen in the Prop 8 case is <laughs> they're just not going to rule on the issue. What makes Prop 8 even weirder is the fact that the people challenging it are not the state. Usually when a law is found, uh, when someone wants to say a law is unconstitutional, you know, a person sues the state, right? You say, Texas, your sodomy law is unconstitutional, strike it down. The problem here is that California and its Attorney General Kamala Harris and previously Jerry Brown hate this law. They don't like Prop 8. So what they do, they decided not to defend it. They didn't defend Prop 8. And by not defending the law, the question arises, who can defend the law? Who can do it? Well, maybe no one. So what happened was a number of uh, kind of religious Christian groups said, you know what, we will step in and we will intervene. But the problem is they don't have standing. They don't have any interest in this law. Usually the only person who has an interest in a law's constitutionality is the executive, the governor, or the attorney general. People don't have an interest in standing. So what the court can simply do is say, listen, you guys, Chuck Cooper, you argue in this case, you don't have standing. We're going to dismiss the case. You lose. And we'll vacate the lower court opinion and we'll just say, all right, California, you're on your own. We haven't touched the merits. Or what the court can do is just something called digging it. Uh, D-I-G. You know, like honey smacks, dig them. It's like that. Dismissed as improvidently granted. What the court can say is, listen, we don't want to take this case. You know what? We thought it was something else. Things weren't what they were. The court is very hesitant to turn this entire map blue. They don't want to do that. That would be a serious, serious order. And remember I mentioned what happened to the judges in Iowa after they ruled in this 18-page this opinion, which I made you read? A lot of them were removed from office. There is a blowback against judges who do things that are not popular. The support for same-sex marriage, though, in this country is, is, is quite interesting. Um, and and this, is a, this is a graph that kind of explains where we've come from, where we are today, and where we're going. And it's fascinating to see how support, this is, I'm sorry, scroll up, this is support for same-sex marriage, how it will evolve in the next 20 years. So let's go back to 2008, when the map was almost entirely red. You go down to Texas, right? God love us, except for Houston, I suppose, and Austin. But 33% of Houston, of Texas, was in favor of same-sex marriage. It's a very small percentage. Poor Mississippi, down to 20%. But look what happens if you go out five, ten years. In some states, it'll reach up to 75%. National average, by 2020, will hit 60%. Even in the Deep South, by 2020, most of the states will crack 
Most of them, not all. Miss, Miss, Mississippi will be stuck in the 40s for, for quite some time. So if anyone from Mississippi, I'm sorry. From, I'm sorry, I, this is Nate Silver, not me. So the sentiment is, let the politics play out. Let the politics play out. If this graph continues its trend and more states are voluntarily turning green, maybe another 10 years, the green will mostly, mostly red. And at that point, maybe it won't be so bad to say this is unconstitutional. But today, we're not quite there yet. When Ted Olson and David Boyes brought the suit in 2008, they probably didn't understand where we'd be. They thought we'd be further along, but we're not. So that's the issue with Prop 8. Um, it's very likely we won't get an opinion on the merits. Whatever I teach this class next year, I'll probably be saying the same thing. We don't know what the law is. But this map will help sear in your mind where we're going forward. The issue of DOMA, though, is slightly different. So let's do a little bit of a, a background. Um, this is uh, uh, Edie Windsor. I think she's 79 years old. She's pretty awesome. Um, everyone see this little round thing? See that? It's, it's covered by the ceiling. This little round thing right there? It's a diamond brooch. Does anyone know why she wears that? Yeah. She was for many years in a committed lesbian relationship. She was not comfortable coming out, and she wouldn't wear a wedding ring. So that was her ring. She wore that everywhere she went. So she actually was in a relationship for 44 years with uh, Mrs. Uh, what's her name? Tia Spider. Uh, they were together for 44 years. And actually, it was kind of touching. The Supreme Court has 44 steps, just when you walk up the steps, which is the same number of years that they were together in a relationship. Uh, they were engaged in 1963. But of course, that was a very long engagement because you can't get married. <laughs> uh, this is before Stonewall. This was not a good time. So they were, they were together for almost 40 years. Uh, by 2007, Canada had legalized gay marriage. Uh, Ms. Windsor's uh, 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 girlfriend, uh, Tia, she became very, very sick with MS, and she was about to die. She wasn't going to make it. And they promised they wouldn't get married until they could get married legally. So they flew to Toronto. And that a wedding ceremony, there was 100 people there, they made a documentary about it. But she was married in 2007. She came back to New York, where gay marriage was not legal in that time. But in her eyes, she was married. Miss Spider died in 2009 with a lot of money. I think her estate was worth like half a million dollars. She had a lot of money. She left her entire estate to Miss Windsor. Everything, Edie, as they call her. She left everything. If they had been married, you know, a guy and a girl, she would not have had to pay taxes on that because there is a certain cutoff of inheritance tax below a certain amount. But because they weren't married, she owed $363,000 in taxes. That's not a small amount. That's a, that's a, that's a big amount. I mean, uh, I think, I think her, uh, her, her wife was a computer programmer or something, or just something very, oh, no, she was a doctor, something very successful. I forgot it. She had a lot of money. So Ms. Windsor had to pay off $363,000 in taxes. And I hope you don't know this, but the way you contest a tax return is you have to pay it first. You pay your taxes, and then you sue for a refund. If you don't pay your taxes, they'll sue you for a collection, so you want to do that. So if you ever think a tax is improperly assessed, you pay it, and then you can challenge it in court. So she paid this $360,000 estate. I think she said she had to sell property just to get the liquidity, because that's, that's a big amount of money. And this one, it was, kind of, it was kind of cute. She was on the Supreme Court steps and she couldn't hear anything. And people were asking her questions. She just was saying whatever she wants. She said, I can't hear you, but I'm going to talk anyway. It was, it was actually really cute. And then she said, you know what? All of you have questions, but my friends want to talk to me, so I'm going to leave now. She just walked away. It was actually it was, it was adorable. It was really cute. Uh, this is a good face for a common law case. So she sued. The reason why is that under federal law, the IRS can't recognize this. Remember we did a case a few weeks ago with a, a joint tenancy in the entirety of whether federal law will recognize it for purposes of tax, even the state law doesn't, and there were different standards. So this is not too uncommon, but this is something different because she was legally married. Had you know any guy and girl gotten married in Toronto, no problem. The United States will recognize that marriage. Actually, friends are married in Canada, they came back to the States, so it's perfectly legal. So had DOMA not been in place, her bill would have been zero. She would have had to take the money free and clear, but she couldn't. And it's not just inheritance taxes. Uh, DOMA affects, I think, 1,100 provisions of U.S. law. Um, for example, uh, you can't file joint tax returns. 
uh, you can share certain health insurance and benefits. Uh, the Family Medical Leave Act, if your spouse is sick, you can take time off from work under federal law. That doesn't apply for same-sex couples. Um, even something as crazy as if your spouse is in, the, is in the service and they are killed, you can't get the official notification that you would get otherwise. Uh, it blocks access to veterans' benefits. There are 1,100 laws that are implicated by this. Going back to the time when DOMA was passed in 1996, when this map was pretty yellow, yellow or unclear, um, sodomy was criminalized in 20 states. Uh, it was an interesting time how quickly things have gone. Okay, so that that takes us to the the Windsor case. This case, and I apologize, I'm lecturing out, but this is just it wasn't in your reading, so I'm not going to expect you to, to know it. The, the Windsor case was something of a different beast, and this will I be this I think will be slightly easier to rule on for a couple of reasons. One, it's not changing any state's law. If the Supreme Court were to find that the Defense of Marriage Act is unconstitutional, everything would pretty much stay the way it is. Look at this map. You got a lot of red states, except for New Mexico. You got a lot of yellow states. You got a lot of orange states. If DOMA is struck down, I guess with the exception of Mexico, every state will be as they were before. California, Nevada, Oregon, they'll recognize same-sex unions from other places. Texas, Mississippi, Georgia, it's already in your constitution. <laughs> so not much will change. So in that sense, it's easier. It will make the administration of federal law more difficult. And what do I mean by that? Uh, it sounds stupid, but it actually is more difficult for the IRS to administer tax returns when there's 50 different standards. It's not uniform. I mean, it's not a particularly strong interest, but it's an interest. There's also the interest of federalism. One of the one of those interesting aspects, I remember when I studied uh, DOMA in law school, this is what intrigued me the most. DOMA tells states how to behave and how to act. Okay? It actually gives them um, uh, you know, reasons why they have to behave differently. So say, for example, you know, if, if New York wants to you know, treat their citizens a certain way, they can't because of this law. So there's, there's, certain, there's certain federalism concerns here as well. Um, of course, there's also the issue of standing in this case. So it's actually a parallel to Prop 8. In Prop 8, you have the case where the governor and attorney general of California refused to defend this law, right? Here, you have a different circumstance where the president of the United States has refused to enforce the law. Oh, I'm going to that. The president of the United States has enforced the law, but he won't defend it in court. What do I mean by that? Usually, the president has a duty in the Constitution to take care of the laws that are faithfully executed, right? What does that mean? The law is being challenged in court. I will send the attorney general to defend it in court. That's been there for 200 years since Marbury. Actually, it's funny. In Marbury versus Madison, uh, President Jefferson refused to send a lawyer to argue in court because he thought the case was so stupid. Uh, but, but that's slightly, that's neither here nor there. So President Obama, when he first came to office, said, yeah, DOMA, fine, I'll enforce it. I'm opposed to same-sex same marriage. But then Biden had to run his mouth and say, oh, yeah, I'm in favor of uh, same-sex marriage. And within two days, the president had to release a statement saying, oh, yeah, I agree with him. You kind of force the issue. So you have to thank Joe Biden for all this. Um, the president, though, took an interesting posture. He said, I think that DOMA is unconstitutional. I think that it's not rational to discriminate between couples of the same sex. There, there's no reason why we treat two men and a man and a woman differently. Okay. But I'm still going to enforce it, which is weird. DOMA is still being enforced. That's why when Edith Windsor went to go to her taxes, the IRS... Senator Bill, had the president thought this was unconstitutional, he could have said, you know what, Edie, don't pay the bill. I'm not going to enforce it. But he assessed the bill. The IRS gave her that bill. So in the same breath the president is enforcing the law, he's also saying it's unconstitutional. This is very rare. Um, and I'm going to play this, this uh, colloquy uh, from the court. So this is only unprecedented. You're asking us to do something we have never done before. So, so the context here is that... Uh, the Obama administration is asking the court to strike down a law that they are enforcing but not defending. And that's never been done before. So this is a question from John Roberts. Before, to reach the issue in this case. Let me say two things about that, if I might, Your Honor. First is that it's, it's unusual, but that's not at all surprising. Because the... No, it's not just that it's not unusual. It's totally unprecedented. Well, it's totally... It has not arisen very often in the past. 
because in the past, when I was at the Office of Legal Counsel, there, there is an opinion of the Office of Legal Counsel which says that the Attorney General will defend the laws of the United States, except in two circumstances. Number one, where the basis for the alleged unconstitutionality has to do with presidential powers. When the presidential powers are involved, he's the lawyer for the president, so he can say, we think the statute's unconstitutional, I won't defend it. The second situation is where no possible rational argument could be made in defense of it. Now, neither of those situations exists here. And I'm wondering uh, if we're living in this new world where the attorney general can simply decide uh, yeah, it's, it's unconstitutional, but it's not so unconstitutional that I'm not willing to enforce it. Uh, if we're in this new world, I, I don't want these cases like this to then come he before this court this all the time. And I think they will come all the time if that's, if, if, if that's the, uh, the new regime in the Justice Department yeah. that we're dealing with. Yeah, that means he doesn't like Obama. But his, his point is sound. I mean, of course, Skittle doesn't like it. But the point is sound. This is unique in that the president is enforcing a law but not defending it. And this creates a problem. If the president takes this posture, there's no one left to challenge the law's constitutionality. If the president won't defend a law in court and Paul Clement, the lawyer, Challenging says, you know, standing. This law is in a weird state. It remains on the books, but no one can take it down. Or worse, if no one can challenge it, the law is struck down automatically. That's what happened in California. If no one has standing to challenge a law, the law must survive. Or here, if no one is standing to challenge it, it's the government arguing that this law is unconstitutional. Obama, the president, is arguing that his own law that he's enforcing is unconstitutional, and no one's there to defend it. Whether or not you agree with the merits of this case doesn't matter. It's a very dangerous precedent. Because imagine a president you don't like. I'll give the example of the morning. President Ron Paul decides not to enforce the Social Security Act, right? You know, he, he won't defend it in court, but he'll keep enforcing it. What would that mean? No, it's in this weird, precarious state where the law exists, but not really. No one, can, no one can have it enforced. So we have to be very careful about that. So, so this, is the, the, this is the issue of standing. Now, the issue that you're probably most interested in is the equality issue. And I think Justice Ginsburg had one of the best lines of the day but here. This is totally unprecedented. You're asking us to do something we have never... Oops. Mr. No state loses any benefits by recognizing same-sex marriage. So, so the setup here is they're talking about what's the harm of allowing this. Now, on Tuesday, when they're arguing about Prop 8, the attorney supporting the law had a very difficult time arguing about why this law should be in the books. He said things about marriage promotes procreation, it's a sacred institution, but every single question that was asked was, why does this matter? How does this hurt anyone? And you had a very tough time arguing it. The court was very scrutinous. That's not a word, but the court scrutinized very heavily. And you'll see in the Iowa case how they do something similar. The question here is how Justice Ginsburg says that uh, there is a difference between calling something marriage and non-marriage. And I, I love the way she phrased this. You might have heard this in the, in the press. But so this is totally unprecedented. No, stop. You're asking us. Sorry. No state loses any benefits. Not, and they're not a question of additional benefits. I mean, they touch every aspect of life. Uh, your partner is sick. Um, social security. I mean, it's, it's pervasive. It's not as though, well, there's this little federal sphere and it's only in a tax question. It's, it's as Justice Kennedy said, 1,100 statutes. Speaks very low. I'm sorry. That's you every read. area of life. And so you would be really diminishing what the state has said is marriage. You're saying, no, state, there are two kinds of marriages. The full marriage and then the sort of skim milk marriage. The skim milk marriage, which, which was a great line, which characterized it because how is it fair that you have some states are giving civil union benefits without calling it marriage? What, what's the difference in the title? 
The one last quote I want to play here talks about the sea change. But so this is um, totally unprecedented. You're asking us to back. do something we have never done before. It's totally unprecedented. What a, what a terrible name for a book, anyway. Okay, so sea change. Why, why are you so confident in that in that judgment? How many how many states uh, permit uh, gay gay couples to marry today? Nine, Your Honor. Nine, and, and and so there's been this sea change between now and. 1996. I think with respect to the understanding of gay people and their relationship, there has been a sea change, Your Honor. How many states have uh, civil unions now? Um, I believe it's, that was, it was discussed in the argument, it's eight or nine. I think. And how many had it in uh, 1996? Uh, I, I, yeah, it was much, much, much fewer at the time. Yeah, it was like three. I don't have that. So the next part, though, is what I want to get to, and this is talked about in the, in the Iowa opinion. One of the reasons why courts apply heightened scrutiny is because you have people who are so-called discrete in minorities that they're outside the political channels and they can't help themselves. What John Roberts is arguing is that the gay rights movement has been very successful. In fact, they've been amazingly successful. And as a product of their own success, they should not be receiving more scrutiny. That is, these aren't poor people who are being deprived access to the courts. This is a very well-funded uh, 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 and successful movement. Roberts is saying, why should we give them this? This is not like saying, you know, poor people and Jim Crow. These are very affluent people who have been able to success things. Um, Justice Scalia in his Lawrence Texas dissent had the line about, if you remember, the homosexual agenda, which is a pejorative term. But the point they were getting at is, why should we get involved? Can't they do this themselves? They've been able to put on the ballot now in all these states gay marriage. Why can't we just let this state, the map turn green naturally? So here, here's, here's the Chief Justice. But Mr. So this is totally unprecedented. No, you You're asking stop. Us no. I'm sorry. Kill, kill my, my thunder here. Uh, wow. I hope this works. But Mr. So this is totally unprecedented. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I'll just read it then because this is being silly. Let's see change. Why, why are you so... So what Robert says, and I'll, I'll do my best John Roberts voice, uh... I suppose the sea change has a lot to do with the political forces and effectiveness of people representing your side of the case. It doesn't really matter what she said. So she says, uh, the sea change has to do with Bowers and Lawrence. It's an important part. Remember what happened to that map after 2003 with Lawrence v. Texas? It lit up like a Christmas tree. 2000, 2003? Boom. Massachusetts and Lawrence within about a year or two of each other turned red. But then it went back. It started turning the other way. So Robert says, isn't there kind of a lobby supporting this or, or a very influential group? And Roberts is doubtful. Robert then says, there are political figures falling over themselves. We've had now, I think, almost 40 U.S. senators come out in favor of gay marriage. Um, yesterday, a senator from North Carolina, a Democrat, uh, uh, Kay Hagan, did it while the case was being argued. So Robert's saying, let the politics do this. But she says, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Chief Justice, no other group in recent history has been subjected to popular referenda to take away rights that have already been given to those people. We've come very far in these 10 years. And there's a lot of echoes of the civil rights movement of actually laws being passed to take rights away from people. I don't know what the court's going to do with this case, um, but the emotion and the uh, sheer inspiration of the people marching in the steps yesterday was just powerful if you watched in the video. But we should be tempered by returning to the Iowa case, which we'll get to, I promise. You didn't read it for naught. We should be tempered by the Iowa case of letting the courts decide this. Okay. So that, that's, that's DOMA and Prop 8. Any questions about that before we turn to Iowa? Yes, sir. So if in DOMA or in Prop 8, if it's found that the, the people defending the bills don't have standing to defend the bills, what happens to the bills? Are they gone? Or so they it's... It's different. So for Prop 8, so, you know, there are three tiers of courts. There's a district court, of appeal, Supreme Court, right? With the Prop 8 case, at the district court, the government of California was still arguing in, against it, right? And they later abandoned that position. They were standing at the district court, but there was not standing at the Court of Appeals. So what the Supreme Court would do is vacate the Court of Appeals opinion and let the district court opinion stay. But the district court opinion has only presidential value for that district. 
right? No courts of appeals for the entire court. District. So it would have a very limited effect. It would only apply to California. It would probably only apply to a district in California, but reasonably with California. But it's a different story, though, with DOMA. If the House Republicans, it's called the BLAG, the Bipartisan Legislative Assistance Group, or Legislative Advisory Group, if they don't have standing, the only people who would be arguing against DOMA would be Edie Windsor. Edie. She would be arguing against no one. She wins. If, you're, if you go to court, right, and you sue someone, and this, you, know, you say this law is unconstitutional and the state doesn't show up, you get default judgment. You win. <laughs> but what makes it bizarre, though, is the president is in the court arguing with Edie. He agrees with Edie. So you have this weird situation where no one is left to defend the law, except for Antonin Scalia. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm being slightly sarcastic, but I'm almost positive however the court decides that they're going to criticize the Department of Justice, saying, listen, you got to defend these laws. This isn't something that, that affects your war powers. This isn't something that affects, you know, that's crazy and unconstitutional. This is something which, you know, every court to look at has pretty much said that, you know, it's a close question. You should be defending it. So to answer your question, if the court dismisses DOMA on standing grounds, then DOMA's gone. They're probably, probably going to roll in the merits here, but they're definitely going to smack down uh, the president because it's, it, it is indeed unprecedented for the court to behave, for the, for the executive branch to behave in this way. Yes, sir. What do you mean a windfall? Uh, like a domino effect? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know with immigration law, DOMA's reason yes. same sex couples can't. Yes. Can Asylum. Yeah, yeah. I, it's horrible. Yeah, I mean, it, it comes up in immigration a lot, for example. So say that, you know, uh, you're a U.S. citizen and then your uh, you're, you're same sex partner is, a, is an immigrant, you can't get a green card for it. Or even worse, say he's overseas, you can't bring him here, even if your home country recognized the marriage. Or, or even worse, comes a political asylum, where if you're being uh, persecuted for some sort of sexual orientation thing, and then you know you're, you say they're oppressing my husband, who happens to be also a guy, then there's a lot of ripple effects that will certainly happen if the court strikes down DOMA. Um, they probably won't strike down all of it. I mean, the issue here is only Section 3, which has to do with defining as a marriage and a woman. There's also the issue of uh, uh, choice of law, which I don't want to get into, but there are a lot of other provisions of DOMA at issue. My friend Will Body has written a lot of articles on that, but not important here. Uh, other questions on DOMA? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I have a question on DOMA. That chart that you had, was it on, uh, is it registered voters or is that just the general population? So this is projected by Nate Silver, and he does a 538 blog at the New York Times. He's a guy who predicts like every presidential race, and he got, I think, I think he got almost every single Senate race correct and almost every single House race correct. The guy's a, the guy's a, is a, guy's a, is a quant, as we call him, a quantitative New York number guy. I don't remember where he got these numbers from. I'm guessing the 2008 numbers, 2012 numbers, people who actually voted in the various initiatives. I think he based 2016, interestingly enough, on projections of age. So you probably know this because you're in the demographic, but younger people overwhelmingly support gay marriage. Even among Republicans, registered Republicans under 30, I think 80% support gay marriage. There'll be more younger people soon, and fewer older people because they die. That's just how numbers go. Uh, it, it's inevitable. Uh, I mean, as Martin Luther King said, the arc of society progresses towards justice, or the arc of the say the, the arc the arc of history uh, bends towards justice. I think it was Martin Luther King. So basically, in ten years or eight years, there'll be a lot more people who are tolerant. You just look at the trends. I mean, just just scroll through this map, you know, over the last twenty years, and it's like holy crap. It's just it just you know, if I'm teaching this class in five years, I expect it to be like almost halfway blue. If I'm teaching this in ten years, we're probably almost all blue, except for like Mississippi, <laughs> Texas. I, I mean, you, politics aside, Texas might not be quite as red in the near future due to immigration influxes. It'll be complete, it'll, it'll well, it, it, it'll be somewhat social conservative, but we'll. we'll We'll see. Maybe in 10 years for your 10 year reunion, we'll, we'll, we'll reminisce, okay? <laughs> What's that? No, I mean, I'm all about Texas being purple in a couple of years, but it's just, I mean, the politics of Texas and even your, some of your, uh, your Democrats won't vote for gay, uh, for gay marriage in Texas. 10 years ago, I think. And the interesting rub is if they give civil union benefits, they might be stuck by having to give gay marriage after that. So there's that weird inertia if we give a little bit, we'll have to give a lot. And that's somewhat counterproductive. 
other questions? Okay, let's let's take a look at the Iowa case. I, I know you slogged through it, um, and it's it's a good it's a good way to kind of summarize a lot of these issues. Um, so, a lot of states, you know, I, I showed this this section of the Texas Code. A lot of states for many years didn't really define marriage clearly. They simply said, you know, a husband and a wife who want to enter into a uh, marriage must obtain a license, right? Who would ever think that a husband and wife can be the same sex? In fact, there's a case in, oh, do you guys know this? In 1974, the Supreme Court ruled on gay marriage. Did I tell you this? In 1974, the Supreme Court ruled on gay marriage. Why does no one know this? Well, there was a case called Baker versus Nelson. We had a, uh, a guy in Minnesota, I think he was either a grad student or a professor or something, uh, he was gay. He and his uh, boyfriend walked into the city hall and they said, give us a marriage license. What do you mean give us a marriage license? Well, at the time, the statute said, a husband and a wife. It didn't have any gender roles assigned to it. And he said, you know what, this doesn't say man and woman, I'm the husband, this is my wife. You know, it, it, that's that's it's you know it's it's an accepted you know accepted term. So it was in 1973. Give me a marriage license. They said, No, you're not getting a marriage license. You're trying to pull a fast one on us. So he sued. It went all up to the Minnesota Supreme Court. The Minnesota Supreme Court said, No, marriage between a man and a woman, even though it's not written in the statute, this is how our history understands it. At the time, the U.S. Supreme Court had mandatory jurisdiction of these cases, meaning they didn't have discretion. So they had to actually take all the appeals, but they didn't actually hear them. So they said, this case, you know what? It does not present a significant federal question. In other words, the case had no merits. That is a ruling on the merits. The 1974 Supreme Court ruled on gay, on gay marriage that there's no federal issue. There's no, no constitutional violation. Uh, it was actually funny listening to the Solicitor General try to ignore that case, uh, which he kind of had to just make stuff up. But it is a ruling on the merits. But Iowa, like many states, let's go back to 1998, and just keep look at Iowa. So Iowa was okay. So Iowa was gray, and then boom, right there, it turned yellow. It made a statute saying that marriage was illegal. A number of uh, uh, committed couples, Iowans, they well, they went to the, the records office. They they um, they applied for marriage license. They were denied. They knew they would be. This was a test suit, and they sued under the Iowa Constitution. Okay. The court ruled on this case, so in kind of an interesting, long, roundabout fashion. Next year, I won't have to assign this case. It'll be something better from the Supreme Court. It wasn't very good. Uh, it was poorly written, and it was kind of a little too sappy for my taste. Uh, they were really trying to, as I say, schmaltz it up in, say, in New York. So the first issue is, is there actually discrimination here? And one of the simplest arguments against it is simply saying, well, you know, if you're a gay man, you can still marry a woman. No one's stopping you from getting married. You're seeking something additional. You want some additional recognition the law doesn't provide. What's the argument against that that the court provides? Anyone, it doesn't matter. Why, why is that not a valid argument that a gay man can simply marry a woman? That, that there's nothing additional being provided. The court actually addresses it. What's the argument? Or anyone? Yes, ma'am. I mean, wouldn't it just be that men and, equal, men and women are equal? So why should it matter to the others? Well, but, but that doesn't answer the question. A gay person can still marry a woman. The law says a man and woman can get married. They, that every, a gay man or a straight man can exercise that statue of life. What's the problem with that? Hmm. Surprise. No, no, we had this one. You've never heard you've heard this argument before, certainly. Yes, sir. What do you mean genetics? Hmm. People marry for reasons other than love. They marry for money sometimes. Hmm. So uh, anyone, your hand up? Is your hand up? No, I won't, but I was is it because um, they said that they were still differentiating between like, gay people and, and non-gay people, so it's still, it puts it outside their realistic reach, because they wouldn't 
Yes. Well, you, you were right up to this period, but then not. Okay, so I thought you were going somewhere else with that. Who would this law have a primary impact on? Gay people or straight people? But the court effectively says is this will have, an, have a disproportionate impact on same-sex couples. That this is not doing anything different to opposite-sex couples, that's what's always been. But it's having some sort of disproportionate impact on gay people. And that creates some sort of a stigma or a way of being treated differently. Another way of looking at it is perhaps a form of gender discrimination. Although it's unclear if sexual orientation is gender discrimination. But the trickiest way of looking at it, and probably the, what the courts have to grapple with, is how do you assess what kind of constitutional analysis applies to sexual orientation discrimination? So, you remember from common law, we're talking equal protection, you know, race is strict scrutiny, right? And gender is intermediate scrutiny. And everything else is rational basis. Where does sexual orientation fall along that spectrum? Anyone? Where do they do that? Is that is that under the U.S. Constitution? Iowa. Iowa. Why do they think that sexual orientation was intermediate? Is sexual and uh, anyone? I don't mean to complain. Is sexual orientation like race? Is it genetic? Is it immutable? What do you think? Yeah, they duck it, don't they? Why do they avoid that hard question? So usually, the Supreme Court differentiates what's called status and conduct, right? If you are born as an African American, and you're born as an African American, there's no question about that. That is who you are. If you choose to engage in a certain activity, let's say sodomy, that's a choice. Historically, the court differentiated between the two. So then this tees up the question. Is being gay a choice? That's a question they don't want to answer. The hard question, is deciding to have a gay marriage a choice? That's the hard question they do not want to answer. This isn't like saying, hey, I'm black, you're not letting me into that public school. That's an easier question. This is saying, hey, I have a certain sexual preference and I want to uh, have the state recognize that in the form of marriage in order to make my relationship feel equal. So it's not skim milk, it's whole milk. That's the issue. The problem is that historically, choices such as conduct were not held to the same level of status. The reason why is because status you can't do anything about. You're born with it. So in order to win this case, what, what, the, uh, what the attorneys have done, which is very bright, is say that, listen, we're not talking about conduct. We're not talking about getting married. We're talking about merely being gay. And that the stigma that attaches to this is what's the problem. It's a very crafty argument. It's very smart. Um, it's not really grounded in the court's history, but it'll probably work as well. But they still need to grapple with rational basis scrutiny, which I'm sure you study elsewhere. Rational basis usually means the government wins. As long as the government can make up some reason why this law stands, then it'll stand. So uh, to answer um, you know, uh, William's question, perhaps in a, an indirect way, if DOMA struck down, it's going to mess things up big time. Now, that might be a good thing, right? You guys want things to be messed up. You want asylum people to be able to have their, their same-sex couples you know, recognized. You don't want Edie Windsor to pay $300,000 of a tax bill. But it's still going to mess things up. It's going to make things complicated for the government. It'll make law non-uniform. Generally speaking, the government says, if you strike this law down, it'll make things non-uniform. That's enough to survive rational basis scrutiny. That's enough. But here, 
It's exactly because they don't want to pay that three hundred thousand dollar bill that they have to strike it down. So the court was just very skeptical of uh, of, uh, of of this professed interest. Okay, here's actually the information. So this is totally unprecedented. Oh, oh enough of this, John Roberts. Fine. Uh, <laughs> it's actually funny. So. Um, you should all be very proud. So Alan Curry, who works at the Harris County DA, he's actually a South Texas alum. He's going to be arguing with the U.S. Supreme Court in about three weeks. You should all be very proud. Uh, he, he's arguing with cases. It's a Miranda case. And I was actually at a moot yesterday trying to prepare him for the Supreme Court. And I was telling him, okay, so here are the different voices you have to kind of know because you don't always know, you don't know where to look. So you have to kind of memorize their voices because um, you probably know this, but the Supreme Court, the place where the attorney's standing, the bench is about here. So you're maybe a foot away from the justices. You're really close. And the bench is maybe about twice the size of this room. So in order to see the flanks, you have to actually pivot and turn your body. It's kind of scary, very intimidating. But going back to this. So, um, oh, so the question, I'm sorry if, if I overlooked that. What's the difference between civil union and marriage? That's, that's a very good question. The difference is the title. And what the people in California argued is that it's unconstitutional to call the exact same relationship something different that the state doesn't have a basis in calling it different. If you're giving us all these rights, you can't call something different because that's discriminatory. That you're inspired by some sort of hateful motivations or animus towards gays. Right? That's where they argue the differences. So here the Iowa court totally punts on the issue of what the nature is of, of this thing. Is it, is it class or is it status? What was some of the other of those four factors? What was another factor that the court looked at? Anyone? Of the group Good. And what does that history show? Uh, that they've been discriminated against. So the court basically says that the county has no argument saying that they haven't been discriminated Yeah, I mean, this. The fact of the matter is, Mr. Chief Justice, is that no what? other group in recent history has been subjected to popular referenda to take away rights that have already been given or exclude those rights the way gay people have. Mm -hmm. It's remarkable to think about this 20-year span of just scrolling through that map. I have a friend who's, who's a gay, and he, he grew up in the 1960s, and he's just trying to convey to me how things have changed so drastically. So although the history is there, and that would usually counsel for increased scrutiny, the other factor, the factor of, uh, how did they phrase it, um, the, uh, the political power have been clashing. In other words, the discrimination and the political power have been rising equally. So along the same time that all of these states started going red, you started having serious social movements to try to stop this. And this is a lesson in how constitutional movements are able to affect social change. Um, there was one argument on, on Tuesday where Justice Scalia asked a lawyer, when did it become unconstitutional to ban same-sex marriage? When? The answer certainly was in 1791 when the Bill of Rights was ratified. It wasn't 1868 when the 14th Amendment was ratified. It wasn't 2003 when Lawrence v. Texas was decided. If you actually read Lawrence v. Texas, Kennedy says in the opinion, this opinion does not say there's a right to gay marriage. Don't worry, chill, right? Scalia in a sense said, nah. You, by doing this, are setting the stage for gay marriage. Ten years later, here we are. In truth, when did, gay, when did it become unconstitutional to ban same-sex marriage? It hasn't happened yet. Still too red. Come back in five years or ten years. I think we'll see the answer when it became unconstitutional. This is how social movements can affect constitutional law. Um, we saw this a lot during the healthcare case, where we had a uh, the Tea Party and other constitutional groups saying, "This is unconstitutional. The government can't make me broccoli. You know, no one can make me do this." And these movements actually affected constitutional meaning. They were able to take these crazy ideas about healthcare and put them onto the wall of relevancy. And it's it's just striking of how quickly it happened. I mean, I I scrolled through this map maybe a dozen times already, but just you don't see change this quickly in the civil rights era. I mean, to go from the Civil War to Jim Crow to the Civil Rights Act to like today, it's like a two hundred year map. <laughs> and and this happened in you know fifteen years. It's astonishing. The other factor the court uh, talks about is there is there a characteristic to contribute to society. And this is where the procreation interest comes in. And this is a, this is a tricky one, uh, um, somewhat. Does the state have an interest in promoting procreation? 
No? Yes? Why does the IRS give this tax deduction to spouses who inherit money? Why does the IRS allow spouses to apply for family medical leave? Why does the IRS allow them to share veterans' benefits? We don't think about it. The reason why. The reason why is because society judge we want to promote marriage. We think it's a good thing. And the reason why is a couple things. One could be, you know, the quote, institution of marriage is a phrase that's thrown around, which I think doesn't have much meaning. But what underlies it is inspiring what they call a responsible procreation, right? Of making people reproduce in a stable environment. The court went through all these questions of is it um, bad for children to be brought up in same-sex environments? And what, what did the court say about that? Well, what they said was, well, there's some studies saying they are, but we're not persuaded by them. In other words, even though we're applying some sort of rational basis or heightened scrutiny, that's not enough for us. Okay. Uh, during arguments on Tuesday, Justice Alito says something to the effect of, we don't know what's going to happen here. We don't know what will happen to society if we let gay people marry. So why don't we just wait and see? Um, I, that does not a particularly persuasive argument because frequently the court does stuff and you know, things happen afterwards. But there is a kernel of truth there. But we don't know what's going to happen. And perhaps we should let the democratic branches resolve this. The Iowa court said, you know what? There's some studies on this side, some studies on this side. We'll throw it up in the air. Who cares? You know, we'll, we'll, we'll use our best judgment. In the end, they found the statute was not constitutional. And again, the aftermath of this case, and, and old, the, that dot of blue and that sea of orange, is that the justices were thrown off. That three justices who were thrown off the bench. And that created a huge controversy, because now we have judges who are afraid to rule that way. So judges in other states might be a little bit more hesitant. So perhaps the Louisiana Supreme Court won't be rolling that time anyway soon, I don't think. So in the end, what, what's going to happen to Miss Windsor, Edie, will she have to pay that tax refund? Uh, she's probably going to get a refund check, and I think she'll she'll spend it well. Um, she's 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 pretty she's pretty spunky, but uh, I think I think she'll spend it well. As for Prop Eight, it's very likely that gay marriage will continue throughout the nation, legalizing state by state, but not by the courts. Yes, sir. Um, I have a question about full faith and credit. Okay. So if you're a yellow state, like Wyoming. Okay, let's go back to the map. Yeah. And I couldn't, if I, not that I want to, but if I got gay married in Wyoming, I couldn't. But if I went to Nevada and went back, they would have to give that full faith and credit, right? Because they're yellow. Um, if, well, 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 yellow states says marriage is illegal. So what that means is not only is it illegal to get married in that state, they won't recognize a gay marriage from another state. So What's the difference between yellow and red? Like how, what, what benefit is there to go It's the difference between st statute and constitution. You can't read them, sorry. It's a lot, okay, so this is actually interesting. In most states to pass a law, a statute, like in Iowa, you just need a 50% majority, right? To amend the constitution, you need a supermajority. By amending the Constitution, it makes it even harder to get rid of it. So go down to this map, right, or this projection. I don't know, maybe someone knows how to amend the Texas Constitution. I'm guessing it's two-thirds? Two-thirds? Yeah, so two-thirds. So even if Texas hits 50%, right, which would be, say it was, say it was 50%, that would be enough for the legislature to repeal it. No, 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 no. it's in the Constitution. You've got to hit 66%. And Texas won't be hitting 66% for a while. And look at the other states where it's currently banned. It's going to be a while. So by amending the Constitution, they've made it more permanent. In fact, to, to bring your attention to another case, you all know about the UT Fisher front of action case, right? There's another case out of Michigan. I actually worked on was clerking. And in full disclosure, I wrote a dissent for it, so I'm totally biased. But after the Michigan front of action cases, the Bruder and Gratz, the people of Michigan passed a referendum, Proposition 2. And what that said is, affirmative action violates the Michigan Constitution. You can't have it. In other words, Michigan schools can no longer use affirmative action. You might think, what's the problem with that? The Supreme Court said, you know what? Affirmative action is barely constitutional. Barely, right? All this law is saying is that we can never use it. But the argument, though, was that by passing this law, 
and making this an amendment, they took the issue of affirmative action out of the hands of the people. And now it's going to be very difficult for African Americans or Hispanics to challenge this in the future. They're going to need two-thirds. So they've taken something that's a constitutional right, kind of, and taken it out of the hands of the people. The, Supreme Court, uh, the Sixth Circuit, where I clerked, ruled that this law was unconstitutional. They struck it down. Uh, the Supreme Court granted cert a few days ago on this case. We're going to hear it next term. They're going to reverse it because it's, it's, it's a terrible opinion. Um, but it does raise the issue of by putting something in the state constitution, you've entrenched it and made it permanent, and you can't get rid of it. Um, the other issue is by the fact they granted this case, the court signaled that they're not going to strike down affirmative action in the Fisher case. If they were to strike down affirmative action in the Fisher case, there's no need to resolve this case because it's easy. So that is the importance of putting the constitution. That's the difference between yellow and orange. So a yellow state already does it have to give full faith and credit to a Nevada marriage? Well, under DOMA, well, there are two answers. You're asking if DOMA struck down or now? Right now. If, no, because of DOMA. But, okay, so even if DOMA struck down. Well, if DOMA struck down, it's a different story. It would then be up to the state to ban it. But so without DOMA, you can't get the gay married in Wyoming, but they might be able to recognize a legal Nevada marriage. Right. So, so if DOMA is struck down, tomorrow or in June, and you get married in New York or, or, or Massachusetts, and then you move to Wyoming, it would then have to be a matter of Wyoming law of whether to recognize that. Now, the full faith and credit clause is, is in the U.S. Constitution. So generally speaking, states must recognize judgments from other states. It's unclear for marriage license that judgment has to be recognized. That's actually, that's actually an open question. And there's actually something called public policy where the state says it goes against their public policy to recognize they don't have to. The full faith and credit issue will be litigated very soon. If DOMA struck down, talk about a domino effect, there's going to be a windfall there's going to be a windfall of litigation about whether Wyoming will now have to recognize a marriage. Because the second DOMA struck down, people can go to New York, Iowa, they get married, they go back to their home state and say, hey, state, recognize me. Give me spousal benefits. Let me get, oh, you know where it comes up? Divorce. There was actually a case about a year ago where uh, two gay guys got married in uh, Iowa, and they came to Texas, and they tried to get divorced. And the Texas court said, you're not married in this state. I can't grant a divorce people who aren't married. Leave, in so many words. <laughs> so the next issue is, can you get divorced? Say, so if you get married in New York, can you get divorced in Wyoming? In order to get divorced, you have to first recognize the marriage in the first place. And that's one of getting around it. That would force a state court to recognize that the marriage was valid in the first place, and then sever it. Or if there's inheritance of, I haven't thought about it. Well, well, could same sex couples get married communal property? I haven't even thought about that, but that's probably, that's probably a lawsuit coming down the pike. So, what if you are married and you want a divorce, so you can just move to Wyoming and live in Wyoming and say, well, we're not married here? Oh, so, so say, like, you know, there's spousal support payments. What, well, actually, most states can, <laughs> they will have jurisdiction of you. Say if there's a child support payment to be paid and you move, you still have to pay the child support payments. So another state could then seize your assets so that you can't get away from it that bad. You can't get out of marriage. You have to actually get divorced. But that presents a problem because for a lot of people, say if they were married in Canada and they wanted to get divorced then, same-sex couples, none, <laughs> New York wouldn't let them get divorced. So they have to go back to Canada to get divorced, but they don't live there. And generally speaking, you have to get divorced in the place you're domiciled, right? So it creates a really weird situation for same-sex couples who are married in a state where they're allowed to. They change their domicile, and they can't get divorced. It's, it's, like, it's like this weird limbo land. So you can imagine the couple gets married in New York, moves to Texas, they hate each other, want to get divorced, and they can't. So then they're stuck. <laughs> you know. Uh, it, it's a weird... You know anything about this, or...? Generally speaking, you have to, and I know from Virginia, but you have to, you have to petition for divorce in the place where the couple's domiciled. I'm assuming it's the same here. Yeah, you can get married anyway. You can go to Vegas to get married. Uh, you can have a wedding, wherever. But the divorce, the reason why it's going to be the division of the assets, it's based on where you and your, your spouse are located. That's generally how it works for property law. All right. Any other questions? All right, very good class. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great day. Enjoy your weekend. I'm going to write this weekend. I promise.